All right. Okay, so Bill is infamous at conferences for asking the greatest number of questions. A recurring joke is that conference session chairs know, uh, who know him will ask, are there any questions from anyone other than Bill? But they're always good ones. He comes up with questions that dig deeply into our basic understanding of the science, and we always learn from him, from them. Gretchen Campbell, physicist, co-director, Joy uh, Quantum Institute. Now, Savannah Cooper, eighth grade, Mariner Middle, and Maxwell Calendro, 11th grade, Dunbar High School said, what makes you the inquisitive person you are today? What makes a good question? What motivated you to keep asking questions and learning? And how did you end up in science? Yeah, well, it's a good question, but you know, lots of times when I when I I feel compelled to say that something is a good question, what it means is it's a hard question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I often think that everyone is curious when they're young, and probably the younger you are, the more curious you are. When I go and talk to a class of kindergartners, they are asking me everything. And when I uh, will do some demonstration, they're just right up there wanting to see what's going on. And I sometimes imagine that scientists are just kindergartners who never really grew out of that childlike curiosity. So I guess one answer to the question might be that the reason that I'm curious is the same reason that I'm a scientist, that I never grew out of that natural curiosity. I'm just continuing to do what any kindergartner would do, which is ask lots of questions. And that's the bill I remember. <laughs> so. but, but let's, let's go to the question about what makes a good question. Yes. For me, a good question is anything that I don't know. I ask questions because I want to know the answers. I know there's a lot of people who either do or think that others do ask questions because they want to show how smart they are. But, uh, or they want to show how dumb the, uh, uh, the speaker is. Uh, that is, they ask questions they know the answer to, and they want to find out whether the speaker knows the answer to. Um, I only ask those kinds of questions if I'm testing a student. <laughs> so in a talk, I ask questions because I want to know the answer. And I think that's enough. A lot of people say that, oh, you know, when you first ask that question, I thought it was a really simple question. But when the discussion continued, I realized it was really deep. Well, lots of times, I didn't realize that it was a deep question when I asked it. It was only when the speaker started to answer it that I realized there was more to the question than what I had guessed. So the, the, the key thing for me is simply to ask questions um, to which I wanna know the answers. But let me say another thing about questions. Lots of times, especially students are reluctant to ask questions because they think, oh gee, if I ask that question, it's gonna reveal that I really haven't understood things properly and everyone will think that I'm dumb, especially the teacher or the speaker or whatever. You shouldn't think that way at all for several reasons. One is if you've got that question, the chances are pretty good that at least half the people in the audience or in the class have a similar question and they'll be so grateful that you asked the question because this will help clarify for them. The other half of the people probably understood things so poorly they couldn't even frame the question that you're asking and they'll be really grateful because it'll make uh, uh, the teacher slow down a little bit and explain things better. And the teacher, if it's a good teacher, is gonna be grateful for the question because now the teacher has some feedback about what's being understood and what's not being understood. And that's one of the biggest challenges when you're a teacher is to figure out on the spot whether the students are understanding what you're saying. So ask questions. <laughs> and listen deeply. Don't listen, I mean, you're basically saying you get your ideas from listening to what other people have to say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. So uh, Dr. Gary Nelson and fifth grade students at Ray V. Podhorf Elementary, Jose Kalis, Lily Devesme, and Melissa Gideon, um, asked about your science fair experiences. Uh, yeah. What were your interests? Um, did you participate in science fairs? And I know you did. Um, I also know you won <laughs> a big award. Uh, which you might talk about. Um, and do you recall 
um, if there, one was a favorite and if you ever had one go wrong or you didn't get the outcome you expected. Well, which is all well so um, of course, one of the things you got to remember is that talking about science fairs is a really long time ago. That's almost 60 years ago. And so remembering the details <laughs> of those science fairs might not be completely accurate when I when I tell you what I what little I do remember. So I guess my favorite science fair projects, I had a couple of science fair projects trying to use ways of um, of tracking the motion of subatomic particles. So, so what I mean is, um, let's say that you've got some radioactive uh, substance and it's decaying and it's spitting out these particles. We call some of these particles alpha particles and some of them are beta particles. And, uh, and there are devices that uh, people have developed over years, like cloud chambers and bubble chambers and spark chambers for tracking the, the particles. So when the particle goes along like this, you can see a picture of where the particle has been. And you might've even seen some of these pictures in books or, or articles about um, these big, uh, 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 particle accelerators like they have uh, in Geneva uh, or uh, like they have in um, outside of Chicago at Fermilab. Well, I was trying to make things like that. And, um, and I guess that uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, doing those things was a favorite thing to do was that I had to learn a lot of stuff in order to do it. And, uh, and that was great. I remember I actually wrote a letter to um, uh, a national laboratory. I had no idea you know, what would happen to this letter. I didn't have anybody there that I knew the name of. And somebody, I can, I, you know, since I now work in a national laboratory, I can imagine what happened. It went to the public affairs office. The public <laughs> affairs office said, hmm, now who am I going to give this to? And gave it to somebody. And this poor schmuck had to read my letter and write a very kind answer describing things, you know, that maybe I didn't understand very well. That was great having a, uh, uh, a contact like that with an honest to goodness scientist. So, so that was one of the things I remember fondly. Good. Um, several students wanted to know more about atoms and lasers. Uh, Chase Brandt, an eighth grader at Mariner Middle, wanted to know, where does the energy of an atom go if it isn't moving? Is it stored in an atom like elastic? Or is it transferred to something else? Um, and then Dunbar High School students, Anais Mara Sarnelli and Brandon Serafathong, and Mariner Middle students Riley Nelson and Lauren Mendez said they want to know exactly what is the point of trapping atoms and why do we need to, why do they need to be cooled with a laser? Is there is that more advantageous than other forms? And what benefits does this present to the real world? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. Yes. And and Kathy, please sort of keep track of what I'm saying. And okay. if I forget some of the pieces, we'll try to come back to those. Okay. So let's start with. Uh, the idea of what it means to cool an atom. So this addresses a couple of the questions. So I think you probably already have some idea of what an atom is like. There's a nucleus. It's really, really tiny. Uh, and around the nucleus, there are electrons. Now, you know, I've, I've done this, like, like the electrons going around the nucleus. That's actually not what happens. But it's an image that is so powerful that was developed only about 100 years ago that we still use it, even though it's wrong. The electron is really in a kind of a cloud so that it's everywhere around the atom. It's one of the weird things about the way atoms work is the electron isn't someplace, the electron is everywhere. And if you say, well, wait a minute, how can that be? The answer is nobody can really tell you how that, that can be. We can assure you that it is that way. It's just that Nothing in our ordinary day-to-day -day experience prepares us for understanding that something like an electron, which seems like a little tiny particle, can be everywhere. But you might think about it this way. Um, let's say you're listening to some sound in a room and you ask, where's the sound? Well, the sound is everywhere, okay? So it's sort of like that, except that 
the reason why the sound is everywhere in the room is the room is filled with gazillions and gazillions of molecules of, of air. And the sound is part of the way those, those molecules are compressing and, and, and expanding. Whereas even if there's just one electron, it can be everywhere around an atom. And so that's, a, that's, that's weird. It's one of the things that draws me to study atoms because they're fundamentally weird in a really wonderful way. But, you know, let's, let's forget about that for a moment. Let's just imagine that an atom is something that's got a nucleus, it's got some electrons. Now you could imagine the whole thing moving. Okay. And when we talk about cooling uh, atoms down, what we mean is we're reducing the amount by which that whole thing is moving. If I've got atoms in the air, it's mostly molecules of hydrogen, uh, not, not hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, you know, some CO2, some water vapor, mostly molecules. They're moving around really fast, around the speed of sound. And if you were to cool the gas down, it would mean that they would be moving slowly. In fact, that's what we mean uh, by being hot, being cold. Being hot means that the atoms and molecules are moving around really fast. Being cold means they're not moving around as fast. So when we say we're going to cool some atoms, it means we're making this whole thing uh, slow down so that what we call the center of mass motion, that means that the whole thing is moving and we're going to make it move less. That's what we mean by cooling. How do we do that? By shining light on it. Usually when you shine light on yeah. stuff, it's hot. And, and I mean, this is kind of an amazing thing. We shine light on stuff and it gets cold. Okay, here's how it works. You got this atom. So now think of my fist as being the whole atom, the nucleus, the electrons and all that. And here comes a laser beam. Now, if the atom is moving this way and the laser comes uh, and hits it, the atom absorbs the light. And how does it absorb the light? The electrons move to a higher orbit. So they have more energy. Okay, that's where the energy goes. It's where almost all the energy goes, but not quite all the energy, okay? So most of the energy goes into exciting the internal motion of the atom. But uh, because the atom, because the light carries what we call momentum, that is it can push things. When the atom absorbs the light, it also slows down because you see it's going this way. Somebody hits you, when you're going this way, you're gonna slow down, right? It also becomes excited. Now, why does it cool down? Because when it, it de-excites, it has to shoot out some light. By the way, the light comes in little particles that we call photons. So it does this one particle of light at a time. It absorbs a particle of light, gets excited, slows down, okay? Not moving as fast. Then it de-excites, shoots out a photon in a random direction. So that means on average, when you do this many, many times, that emitted photon doesn't change the velocity of the atom. For each individual one, it does, but when you average over a whole lot, it averages out. So the main effect is the effect of this laser beam that slows it down, okay? Now, here's the magic. That's fine if the atom's going this way and the laser beam's going this way, but in a gas, the atoms are going every which way. You don't get to choose which atoms uh, you want to hit, the ones that are coming toward you. Or you might think you don't get to choose. You do. And that's because of something called the Doppler shift. And that's where the word Doppler cooling comes in. Okay, the Doppler shift is this. And you may have even experienced this. If you were listening to a, a horn, that was uh, uh, in a car and the car was coming towards you. Let's say somebody was, was beeping, was doing their horn continuously as they were driving towards you. You would hear the pitch of the horn was higher when the car was coming towards you than if the car was going away from you. That's the Doppler shift. When something's coming towards you, the frequency is higher. When something's moving away, the frequency is lower. So if the atoms are moving toward the laser beam, it looks to the atom like the frequency of the laser beam is higher. Now, if you adjust the frequency of the laser, now I said frequency of the laser, light is a wave and it's got a frequency. It's really, really high frequency, 
okay? But it's a frequency, just like sound has a frequency, just like uh, radio waves have a frequency. If you listen to the radio, you tune the radio to the frequency that you want, you know? So if you listen to FM radio, you might be listening to a radio station that calls itself 99.5, you know, the biggest hits. And that means 99.5 mega cycles per second. Okay, million, 99.5 million cycles per second. Well, light is like a gazillion cycles per second, where a gazillion means uh, 10 to the 14, a few times 10 to the 14, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is that um, uh, the frequency looks higher to the atom when it's moving toward the laser beam. If you tune the frequency of the laser beam so that its frequency is a little bit lower, then when the atom moves, it sees it being a little bit higher. And here's the point that I forgot to mention. The atom only absorbs the light that has exactly the right frequency or almost exactly the right frequency. So if you tune the laser so that it's not the right frequency, but you tune it so it's lower in frequency, so that it's uh, instead of, uh, okay? Then when the atom moves, instead of, experiencing the frequency is, uh, it experiences the frequency is, uh, and it absorbs it. And when it absorbs it, it slows down. Now let's say the atom is moving in the other direction. If the atom absorbed the light when it was going this way, it would speed up and you don't want that. You want it to slow down. So, uh, and it works perfectly because when the atom is moving that way, it thinks that the frequency is even lower uh, and it doesn't absorb it at all. Now, uh, I might've, cause a little misunderstanding. The amount by which the frequency changes is minuscule, okay? When I go from uh to uh, I'm changing by something like a factor of two. The light changes by uh, a few parts in hundreds of millions, okay? <laughs> so you would never be able to tell that difference if, uh, if you were to look at the light, uh, the frequency is what determines the color. You'd never be able to tell, but the atoms are so exquisitely sensitive to color that they can tell the difference easily. And so when they're moving this way, the color looks right and it slows down. And when it's moving this way, the color looks wrong and it doesn't speed up or at least not much. And that's the magic of how what we call Doppler cooling works. And we call it Doppler cooling because the Doppler effect is the key thing there. So, okay, now I'm lost. Where, what, what, what well, should so I answer that? You can explain why it's moving. And you also talked about the Doppler effect. I think the question is, what is the point of doing this? Yeah, okay. Matt. So, right. So the point of doing it, the reason why we got started in the first place was that we wanted to make better clocks. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, how's this gonna make better clocks, you know? Uh, and the answer is that the best clocks since, oh, probably about 1950. Okay, so this is, you know, before your parents were born, not before you and I were born, Kathy. We were just little babies then, though. <laughs> so, so since about 1950, the best clocks have been what we call atomic clocks. And uh, the way an atomic clock works is you shine some frequency in at the atoms and you see whether the atoms absorb the frequency or not. And because the atoms will only absorb the frequency, if it's just right, this works really great. You tune the frequency until you can see the atoms are absorbing it. And then you know that frequency is some very precisely determined frequency. And I use that frequency to uh, tick the clock, okay? Just like today, if, well, actually nobody wears a watch anymore, okay? Uh, you all, everybody gets their, their time from a cell phone. And by the way, that cell phone gets its time from atomic clocks that are in orbit around the earth, but that's another okay. story. <laughs> but inside this watch is a quartz crystal. It's, it's vibrating like a tuning fork. And that's the thing that's guiding the ticking of the clock. Well, instead of having a tuning fork, you've got atoms. And they make the best clocks because atoms are not affected by the kinds of things that might affect other kinds of ticking devices, like a tuning fork. Change the temperature, you know, it changes a little bit. That doesn't happen so much with atoms. So, uh, but here's the problem. The atoms are moving every which way, okay? And that means they're really hard to measure. For one thing, they don't stay around very long, and it's hard to measure something that is... 
uh, gone in a tiny fraction of a second. But in addition, this Doppler effect that I was talking about, that works on the atoms too. And that makes it hard to, uh, uh, to measure the, the frequency of the atoms. So if we could make the atoms go more slowly, then we could make better clocks. That was why we got started in the first place. And it's worked. And today, time for the entire world is kept by clocks that have laser cooled atoms in them. So when you get your time from whatever device you get it from, your cell phone or, uh, 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 well, that's where everybody gets it from. Or it, 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 yeah, go ahead, Kathy. So, so um, in terms of moving science forward, um, how is that application used in other fields of science mm -hmm. maybe to, um, to some effect? Okay, so let me give you two examples, one of which is how it's used in science, and another one is how it's used in technology and daily life. So having these incredible clocks allows us to study some of the most fundamental ideas in physics. Einstein taught us all kinds of amazing things. And one of the things he told us was, if you've got two clocks that are ticking away at whatever frequency they tick at, and these two clocks are then moved together up or down in the Earth's gravitational field or the sun's gravitational field or whatever, as long as those clocks aren't like pendulum clocks that <laughs> depend on gravity, then they can still change their, their ticking frequency, but they will change by exactly the same fractional amount. So if I have two clocks that are made with completely different atoms, and I move them up and down in a gravitational field, they, the ratio of those two ticking frequencies should stay perfectly the same. And having these really great atomic clocks allows us to test that idea better than we've ever been able to test it before. And so far, it pans out. But we're hoping that eventually it won't. Why? Because Einstein's theory of gravity is one of the best theories there is. It hangs together perfectly, and all the tests that we've made of it just work out perfectly. There's another theory, also from the 20th century, called quantum mechanics. It's the one that tells us how atoms and molecules work. It seems to be perfect. Every time we test it, absolutely right. Those two theories are incompatible with each other. And one of the great challenges of science today is to come up with a theory that puts these two things together. You might've heard about string theory. This is one of the attempts to do that, but it hasn't worked yet. And if we can find something wrong with one of these theories, it might give us a clue about how we can come up with a new theory that combines the features of both. So that's one of the scientific reasons. Practical reason is the global positioning system. The global positioning system has atomic clocks on each of at least 24 satellites that are uh, circling the earth all the time. And the fact that we can use our cell phones to guide us to uh, some place that we wanna go to is because of the fact that those atomic clocks keep such good time that uh, they allow us to use that time to tell where we are when we're looking at several of those satellites at the same time. Now, uh, those satellites don't yet have laser-cooled uh, clocks in them, but on the ground, the, the clocks that are controlling the clocks that are in orbit, they do use laser cooled atoms. And so they're helping us to make that whole GPS system better. So those are, you know, sort of the opposite ends of the spectrum. The very practical people use every day, they use the GPS to find their way around. And this idea of testing some of the most basic theories that we have of the way nature works, both of them are affected by making better clocks. And that's why you will be spending the rest of your life at work. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, 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 I, I, I can see it. So um, tell us about your beard and- <laughs> Yes, well- is that, is that because you're at home and you don't have to go to work or what's the story? Well, you know, once, uh, here, let me, let, let me stop my video so you can see what I used to look like not very long ago 
uh, well, I mean, except for the fact that the beard was dark, that was about the length it was about a year ago. Yeah, that's okay. what I remember. Right. And uh, uh, when we started uh, into this pandemic and we were locked down and I, I couldn't go to work anymore, so now I only telework, you know, and I talk to my colleagues, you know, just the way we're talking, and we even examine students uh, this way and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I give lectures uh, uh, both at the university and, uh, and, and to, to university departments all around the world. Well, I, you know, it's great that we can use this technology, but it's no substitute for being there in person. Yeah. And so I'm really eager to get back to work in person. And so I decided, look, I'm just not gonna cut my beard until this pandemic is over or at least until I can get vaccinated. So I feel uh, a little safer uh, being able to, uh, to communicate with other people. They're probably still not gonna let me go back to work even after I get my vaccination, although I'm gonna push a little bit. Uh, but I haven't gotten fully vaccinated. So I have not cut my beard since, well, probably January a year ago yeah. uh, because I was off to, I, I cut my beard just before going off to Antarctica. Uh, and uh, by the time I got back, things had started to go bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I never got around to cutting my beard before we went to lockdown. And then I thought, no, nope, not gonna cut my beard anymore. <laughs> was that trip for fun or for work? Uh, well, everything is almost always for work, but it was a lot of fun just the same. Good. So, the reason why I was, uh, I was going to Antarctica was that I have a good friend in Brazil. And this may bear on some of the other questions that, that, that people have had. One of the greatest things about being a physicist is you end up with friends all over the world because people are doing physics all over the world and science is an international um, uh, endeavor. And so I've got friends all over the world. So I have this really good friend uh, in Brazil and he got uh, some kind of an award from the Brazilian Navy that included going to Antarctica. And he said, how about if I invite my friend from the US? Uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, has done a lot of work for the US Navy. Uh, he'll come and he'll give a talk to your Navy uh, graduate school and we'll go to Antarctica and we'll talk to the scientists there and this will be fun. So they said, sure, let's do it. And uh, so it was quite an adventure. <laughs> we, uh, we never actually got to talk to the scientists in Antarctica just because, you know, it's hard to get around in Antarctica. <laughs> and we got to one research station, but we didn't get to the one where the Brazilian scientists were that we wanted to talk to. But, you know, we did get to see Magellanic uh, penguins, not in Antarctica, but in uh, an island on the Straits of Magellan. And mm -hmm. so that was pretty cool. And, uh, uh, and we get, did get to talk to all the young uh, uh, officers in the Navy who were studying science. That was fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it's some of the students, and I'm going to mention names, let's see, Carson Mulvey, an 11th grader at Dunbar High, 8th uh, grade students at Mariner Middle, Edward Garcia, Joshua Marrero, and Lily Jana Mitchell, all wanted to know, so how did you, how did you start out? You wanted, you had a problem. Um, you know, how do you define your problem? How do you start, you know, What's the process for you? Yeah, well, I suppose there's lots of different ways that uh, scientists go about choosing what the next thing they're gonna work on is. I can remember that when I was um, a student at MIT, in fact, it was just about the time that I finished my PhD, I stayed on as a postdoc. And uh, so that means, you know, after getting your doctoral degree, you do a postdoc that is, which is, you know, after your doctoral to do some, some research that's more independent where you're really asked to set the directions of the research instead of doing what your thesis advisor told you you should do. This is about the time that we expect scientists to start to set new directions. And so I was reading a lot of scientific papers and I read one scientific paper in which uh, a guy from, uh, from Bell Labs, who by the way, just got a Nobel prize like two years ago, he's in his nineties now. And he's 
He's got a long beard. <laughs> and he just got a Nobel Prize for something else. But he had this idea for doing just what I was describing to you about having atoms going this way. He was saying, let's make a beam of atoms so they're all going this way. This simplifies the process. Let's have a laser beam going this way so every time the atom absorbs from the laser beam, it'll slow down. And I thought, oh, what a cool idea. That just sounds like it should be a lot of fun. And it just so happens that I had in the lab an atomic beam with atoms, and I had a laser that would be absorbed by those atoms if I tuned it right. So I went in the lab and tried it, and I said, hmm, this is more complicated. I could immediately tell that this was a problem that was more complicated than what this guy had said in this article. But the article still intrigued me, and I thought, I bet I can solve those problems. And I spent the next 10 years of my life trying to solve those problems, and it turned out pretty well. <laughs> So, so, so the, the short answer to the question is, I, I came up with the problem by reading what other people thought were interesting problems and finding one that really appealed to me. Another way of saying, of, of, of talking about a problem is, but it wasn't the way it worked in this case was, ah, atomic clocks, I need to make them better. How am I going to do that? And there were other people who came to this same problem from that direction. But you see, I came to it by saying, oh, this just really looks like a lot of fun. But when I got into it, I thought, ah, there's this really practical reason for why we should do that. And when I went from MIT, where I'd gotten my degree, to what was then called the National Bureau of Standards, now the National Institute of Standards and Technology, their business is making better measurements of things. And one of those measurements is the measurements of time with clocks. And I thought, this is perfect, because it sounds like it's a lot of fun, it's really cool, and plus, it's going to make better clocks, which is just what this place is supposed to be doing. So I was sort of combining those two features of how you might decide how to, how to work on a particular problem. There's probably lots of different ways. So, so you mentioned the work of others. Um, one of the students asked, Aiden York asked, what made Daniel Kleppner's work so appealing to you? Now, he was your thesis advisor, he, right? Right. Yeah. What a guy. I mean, I was so, so lucky to have Dan as my thesis advisor. But I would say that the thing that made me decide to work with him was not so much because I understood what he was doing and that appealed to me. It was... It was a personal thing. He wrote me a letter when I was an undergraduate and said, I was reading your application to graduate school and noticing that you've been doing some work in this particular area. We're doing work in a similar area. Would you be interested in joining us? And the fact that he had written me personally like that. Now, this is in the days when people wrote letters with pen on paper, you know, and put a stamp on them and put in an envelope and send it through the mail. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so I went to visit. And I'd also applied to Harvard, and, and, and so I went to visit Harvard. And just um, the talking to him, but just as equally important, talking to the other people who were in that research group, I just got the feeling, this is a good place to be. I'd like to spend the next several years here because this seems like a good place, a place where um, uh, I can really learn and develop as a scientist, a place where I'm gonna be happy. Now, of course, phone ringing in the background, this is standard for a Zoom call. Pretty soon there should be a cat, you know. That's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, science then is really not a scientist in his lab. Science yeah. is working with different people, talking about what you're doing, finding out what they're doing, seeing if they can in some way uh, become part of that path that you're on, even if they're not on it the whole way. Does that make sense? Well, for me, absolutely. For me, that's always been the way it is. In fact, I think if I look back at the papers that I've written, there are less than a handful of papers on which I am the sole author. Every one of those papers was something that I did in collaboration with other people. And for me, it's been so important because the ability to bounce ideas 
off of one another. I mean, we get together in a room and discuss what's going on. We have a problem in the lab. We, we look at it together and think about how we can solve these problems. For me, that's, that's the way it's always been done. There are people who work alone. Uh, and some of those people are just amazing. Well, Einstein worked alone most of the time. Somebody like uh, Paul Dirac, uh, another uh, great scientist of the, uh, in the development of quantum mechanics, worked alone. Um, uh, but I would say the vast majority of scientists collaborate. And it's becoming harder and harder, especially in experimental science, to do something alone because the experiments are becoming more and more complex. You have to have people who understand deeply the different aspects of the, uh, uh, of the experiment. So it's become really difficult to do everything yourself. Uh, well, let's switch gears for a minute because a lot of kids asked about this thing called the Zeeman Slower. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We had Mariner middle, uh, middle eighth grade students, Andy Espinosa, Dorada Torna, Alyssa Heineman, Jason Feldman, Lillian Lydic, and Jeremiah Cadora all wanted to know what is a slower? Why did you choose to create it? Was there something in your life experience that led you there? Um, just all kinds of questions about this okay. even slower. So I'm quietly. Right. So I've multiply. often said. Right. I've often said that the Zaman slower was my one good idea and everything else was just luck. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's uh, it's not entirely an exaggeration because uh, it is something that I came up with on my own. Uh, and uh, whereas most of the other things were sort of natural developments of, of the way the experiments go. But let me start from the beginning to describe why we need a Zaman slower and what it is. Now, remember this image that we've come to before. Atoms are going this way laser beam is going this way. If the atoms absorb the light, they'll slow down. That's great. Now, um, uh, I didn't talk about it much, but we, we have this thing called an atomic beam. We heat up some atoms, uh, uh, they, uh, they evaporate, uh, the gas that, that is evolved as a result of the evaporation of this metal, we started with sodium uh, and uh, uh, it's all in a vacuum because you may know that sodium burns in air, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we do all these experiments in a vacuum. We heat up the sodium, it evaporates. Uh, we have it inside a can, there's a little hole in the can, atoms come out of the hole and head this way. So that's our atomic beam. We have a laser shining this way. Okay, I got to watch this virtual background because it makes my finger disappear a little bit. <laughs> Go up here. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, the laser beam is going this way. And if the frequency of the laser beam is just right, then the atoms will absorb the light and slow it down. But here's the problem. The atoms from this atomic beam are not all going at the same velocity. Uh. So that means they're all gonna have different Doppler shifts and they're gonna see the frequency of the laser as being different. Each one of those atoms is gonna see the frequency of the laser as being different. So that means there may be some of these atoms that have the right velocity that given the Doppler shift and given whatever you set the frequency of the laser to, turns out to be the right frequency and those atoms absorb the light and they slow down. But now that they've slowed down, they're not in resonance with the laser. In resonance means they're at the right frequency to be absorbed because they slow down now their Doppler shift isn't the same thing anymore. So what's going to happen if you do this, and we did it, <laughs> we knew what was going to happen by that time, was you're going to slow down a small fraction of the atoms, and you're going to slow them down by a small fraction of their velocity. That's not what we're interested in doing. We want to slow down a large fraction of the atoms by almost all of their velocity. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, I thought about that for a while and I came up with four different ways of doing it. Now, I'm not gonna describe them all. Uh, it turns out that this one that's called the Zeeman slower is the one that everybody has decided to use. So if you go into laser cooling laboratories all over the world, most of them have a Zeeman slower. So that's one of the reasons why I say it was a good idea. Uh, but at the time, I didn't know. We didn't know what was going to be the good idea. There were all these other ideas. So um, at that time, I was working with a good friend of mine, somebody that I'd known for a number of years from a different university. He would 
uh, come, you know, spend a couple of days, sometimes a week or more with us uh, in our lab. And we'd work on these things together and then he'd go away. And so we were sitting around talking about this and what should we do? How should we make this work? And he said, let's try this idea of the Zaman story, which I haven't yet explained what it worked, how it works. But, but he said, it sounds like it's more fun than the other ones. And that's why we decided to use the Zaman slower okay. because it seemed like it would be more fun. Okay, so what is it? Well, the frequency that an atom likes to absorb can be changed by putting it into a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And that effect of changing the frequency that the atom wants to absorb, or for that matter, emit, uh, when you put it in a magnetic field, it's called the Zaman effect after a guy named Peter Zeman, who worked around the turn of the century, that is around 1900. Well, he discovered the Zeman effect, I think in 1897, okay? Without a clue of what was going on, because at that time, a lot of people didn't even believe in atoms, let alone, you know, understand how they worked. People didn't understand how atom works, worked until another 25 years later. But, he discovered that, that the light that came out of atoms would change if you put them in a magnetic field. So we thought, well, gee, maybe we can use that to fix this problem, that as the atoms slow down, they are no longer uh, seeing the laser as having the right frequency. So what we, we did was we made what we called a tapered solenoid. A solenoid is just a coil of wire wound around a cylinder, okay? And what we did was we wound more wire up at one end of the cylinder than at the other end of the cylinder. So the magnetic field is stronger here than it is here. So the atoms will be shifted a lot here and only a little here. Well, the atoms come in and those atoms that have the right velocity uh, so that the Doppler shift uh, looks so that it makes, makes the, the atoms uh, uh, see this laser as having the right frequency. In addition to the magnetic field here being high enough, you just have to change the frequency of the laser a little bit more to compensate for the, the magnetic field effect. Those atoms slow down, but they move a little bit this way. So now the Doppler shift isn't the same, but neither is the Zeeman shift because the field is changing and we can fix it so they completely cancel each other out. Uh -huh. So that as the atom slows down, the change in the Doppler shift is compensated by the change in the Zeeman shift. And, uh, and then the atoms just go all the way down. It's about a meter long and uh, they slow down almost to zero. And that's what a Zaman slower is. And it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it's being used in labs all over the world. Yeah. To, to, to what other kinds of things is it being used for? I mean, it's, uh, Probably not the right way to ask the question, but how? how well, whether well, what other things are maybe maybe the way to ask the question is what other things does our laser is laser cooling being used for? Yes, because the Zeeman slower is only being used to slow right. down atoms, right. but people are using laser cooling to do all kinds of stuff. At the beginning, we were just thinking about clocks, but um, I just just before we did this, I was listening to a Zoom lecture. Uh, a good friend of mine at MIT was um, uh, telling about the latest experiments in their laboratory where they're trying to understand things about magnetism by using cold atoms. And the Zeeman slower has become such a standard tool that he only mentioned it in passing when he was showing uh, pictures of his lab. He says, and over here, there's a Zeeman slower, which is kind of kind of weird because we've, instead of having it horizontal, we've turned it up on end to give us more room in the lab. So it didn't, didn't take up room on the table, but yeah. you know, he was, he, he didn't even talk about how the Zeeman slower works because it's like, it's become like a screwdriver. Nobody talks wow. about how a screwdriver works because everybody has one. So, so he just said, oh, but this, this Zeeman slower is sticking up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I see a Zeeman on slower, it makes me feel good. Oh, good. But he's, he's studying the, the basic physics of magnetism. You know, what makes magnets work the way they do? This is still something that is um, 
uh, is a subject of intense study because magnets are really quantum mechanical things and uh, mysterious and wonderful things. And uh, so they're studying quantum magnetism using cold atoms. So there's an example of something else it has nothing to do with clocks. Uh, and it may be that other people will use this to understand how high temperature superconductivity works. That's another thing that's still a matter of, of intense study. We don't understand how high temperature superconductors work. And people are using cold atoms to try to understand that. Other people are using cold atoms to understand black holes. So there's a wide range of things that people are applying cold atoms to. Quantum computers, that's a really big deal these days. And cold atoms are being used for that. So let's talk about what happened after you did all of this research and you published these results and you shared them with people. Um, the Mariner Middle students, again, have questions about what it's like to be a Nobel laureate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, did you expect to win the Nobel? And it was, uh, does it help in your career? Uh, does it help in your work? Okay, lots of different questions. So, so yeah. remind me if I don't if I don't address okay. all of them. When I was young, like middle school age, of course, you got to remember that when we were young, there wasn't any such thing as middle school. There was elementary school and there was and junior high school. high school and there was high school. So middle school didn't exist. But you know, when I was of that age, I thought, ah, I'm gonna be a scientist and I'm gonna win a Nobel prize. And uh, when I, uh, by the time I'd finished college and learned about the things that Nobel laureates had done to get a Nobel prize, I thought, Forget that. There's no way I'm ever going to win a Nobel Prize, <laughs> but I'm going to have a lot of fun because physics is just so cool. And it doesn't seem like you could ever run out of cool things to do as a physicist. This is going to be a really good life. And Nobel Prize, sure, but, um, but, but that's not what it's about. And there's no way it's going to happen because that only happens to, you know, people who are, are amazing like Einstein. Then, you know, we did this laser cooling and I realized this is pretty important. Mm. It's probably worth a Nobel prize, but that's never gonna happen because so many people all over the world had contributed so much to the understanding that led us to laser cooling that there's no way because you can only give a Nobel prize to at most three people. Mm. And when I thought about things. Well, you know, I, I, I talked about that, that paper that I read when I was at, at MIT that described this idea that it was too naive, but it was nevertheless a very cool idea. Well, that guy eventually got a Nobel Prize, but not for laser cooling. Okay. And in that same year, I read another paper by a guy who'd actually done the first laser cooling. We didn't do the first laser cooling. We were years afterwards where we finally did the first, did laser cooling of of neutral atoms. This guy in that same year had done uh, laser cooling of ions, charged atoms, atoms that have lost an electron. Uh, and that was the first laser cooling ever. And there were two papers that were published within a week of each other, I think, in which they'd done the first laser cooling, each of which had multiple authors. And a number of those people won Nobel Prizes for something else. But you, you, see, you see what I'm getting at is uh, that, that so many people had done such important work. Uh, so like at the same time that I was doing this work at, 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 uh, at NIST, Steve Chu was at Bell Labs. Now that name may be familiar because he was the Secretary of Energy in the first Obama administration. The first cabinet official who was a Nobel laureate at the time time that he was appointed to the cabinet. It happened, you know, that some people like Henry Kissinger got a Nobel Prize afterwards, mm -hmm. but he was the first Nobel laureate ever appointed to uh, a cabinet position. Well, he was doing similar work. Well, he did share the Nobel Prize, okay? But the people that he worked with, which had, who had also contributed very much, including uh, Art Ashkin, who came up with this, you know, idea that inspired me so much, didn't share in the prize. And I just thought this is never going to happen because too many people have contributed too much to this, uh, to this enterprise. But the Nobel uh, Committee had a different idea. What they thought was, well, let's look at the people who are the, 
the intellectual leaders of the various groups that have, have done this. And let's, you know, there's lots and lots of groups. Let's look at the groups who have really changed the directions of things. And let's restrict ourselves only to neutral atoms. <laughs> Okay. They, this was the kind of thinking that it apparently was going on. Now, we're never going to know exactly what their thinking was because the uh, notes of their discussions are embargoed for 50 years. So we'll all be dead by, by the time we know. But historians of science can, if they think it's interesting, can speculate how did they decide to do this. Uh, the people People in the ions were recognized later for doing for other things that 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 they did that depended on laser cooling, and other people were recognized for things that depended on laser cooling. We were recognized for developing the techniques of laser cooling. So I never expected, as a you might say as an adult scientist, that I was going to get a Nobel Prize, and so I was attending a a meeting, scientific meeting. It's one of the things we do all the time back when we could travel. Uh, now we attend them virtually, uh, but I was in California. I live on the East Coast, just like you. Uh, I was in California uh, and uh, uh, at this meeting after a, day's, a, a day of listening to exciting talks, a bunch of us were sitting around having a, a cup of coffee or a a cup of tea or something, and we were saying, tomorrow they're going to announce the Nobel Prizes. I wonder what's going to be recognized this year. And we had some colleagues, one of whom, maybe two of whom were there at the, uh, at the meeting, we said, wouldn't it be fantastic if they got the Nobel Prize? It'd be really cool because they're right here at this conference. This would be, this would be just fantastic. Nobody suggested, Bill, you know, maybe you're going to get the Nobel Prize this year. <laughs> that was not in people's thinking at all. And middle of the night, you see, they, they decide this by a vote of the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which occurs around noontime in Stockholm. That's around six o'clock. Well, is it, that, that is six o'clock in the morning. Noon, noon is six o'clock in the morning in the East Coast of the United States and three o'clock in the morning in California. So around three o'clock in the morning, the phone rings in this hotel where I'm staying. <laughs> what? Three o'clock in the morning? What? And I, I would pick it up and it's a guy with a Swedish accent. Uh, uh, he introduces himself as being the, the, um, uh, the chair of the uh, uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Science. And he's so pleased to inform me that I'm sharing this year's Nobel Prize with Steve Chu and Claude Contenucci. Uh, and as I recall, my reaction was something like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> now here's, here's the thing that I thought was really cool. At that point, he says, well, I've got one of your colleagues on the phone. He would like to congratulate you. This is somebody who I knew personally. The guy who was calling me was, he was in the field of genetics or something. I didn't know him at all. But the guy he next put on the phone was a physicist whom I'd known for many years. So he talks to me and congratulates me. And I'm pretty sure the reason why he put my friend on was because sometimes people have been pranked mm -hmm. by having somebody call them in the middle of the night with a Swedish accent to, you know, and he wanted to make sure that I really understood this was for real. Steve Chu, they called Steve Chu at the same time, but the area code in Stanford where he was at that time had changed between the time that they had discovered what his home phone number was and the time that they called him so they couldn't get through. So it was, a little later that the newspapers, the journalists were calling him, telling him that he'd oh, gotten geez. the Nobel Prize and asking him for comment. And he, <laughs> being a very wise person said, well, I haven't seen the official notification, so I don't have any comment. And so eventually, you know, he, uh, he learned, this is the time, this is before people were spending all their time on the, on the web, you know, and you would immediately see everything. Um, 
uh, so eventually, you know, he did, and and uh, they called called Cohen to the same time zone. They called and they they got him at lunch, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so um, so that was an amazing thing. I was totally surprised because uh, there were all these reasons why I didn't think that uh, I thought the work was worthy of a Nobel Prize, but I didn't think it would be possible because so many people had been uh, uh, had been involved. But I think that the Nobel Committee really wanted to recognize the work in the same way, for example, you could have thought the same thing about gravity waves. So many people worked on gravity waves, but they wanted to look at the people, the people who started it, the people who had the key ideas. So, because it was important to recognize such an important thing. Um, I, I don't wanna go on forever. So let me just ask <laughs> another couple more questions and then I'll, I'll let you, uh, tell us what you would like us to hear. But um, I, I, when we talked, you said something about, you wanted to talk to students about how important the rest of your curriculum was yeah. when you were studying. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? So lots of times you get this kind of a question and it's a pretty common and, and perfectly reasonable question. What should I do? Uh, if what, what should I study if I want to be a scientist? And the obvious answer is, well, you should sci study science and math. And that is a completely correct answer. But the thing that people, I think, often forget is you should study English. You should learn how to write well. Because when you become a scientist, if you do research, the way in which that research is exported to the world is by writing. You write a scientific paper in which you describe in as clear and concise a way as you can what you did and what conclusions you drew and why. And this gets published after being reviewed by, uh, by your, your fellow scientists. Uh, and they usually make suggestions and then you make changes to polish it up. And, uh, and then the thing gets published and then people all over the world read it, just as I did back when I was uh, uh, a postdoc and, uh, and get new ideas. And that's how science progresses. Uh, if you're not a good writer, people will have a hard time understanding what you've written. The essence of good writing is clarity. And it's one of those things that you learn by studying English and by having the essays you write in English class be corrected viciously by your English teacher. Now, if they're kind, they won't appear to be vicious, but they will you know, find all the things that you're doing wrong and, uh, 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 and, and suggest how you can do this better, how you can structure your sentences so that you use parallel construction. You've probably all heard of that. Use parallel construction. It's a powerful way of doing things. Use active voice because it's a stronger way of, uh, of expressing your ideas. Uh, don't switch around your tenses all the time because it'll confuse people about what you're talking about. You know, make sure that you don't have indefinite antecedents so people aren't confused about what it is you're talking about. Uh, Make sure that the commas are in the right place so that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's clear uh, what, what you mean. There's all kinds of misunderstandings. You know, people write, write books about the use of commas. You may have heard about this book uh, called Eat, Shoots, and Leaves. And it all yep. depends on where you put the commas, what the sentence means. And, you know, you learn these things and it's important to learn them and it's important to have them be part of your second nature when you're writing things. And I think lots of times when people think about studying science, they don't think about that. Another thing that's really important about science is going to scientific meetings and listening to talks. And here's where, when I was in high school, I was in the, uh, the debate society and we learned how to give a short presentation that would be clear and concise and get the message across in a short period of time. When you're giving a talk, especially at a scientific meeting, sometimes you've got 12 minutes to give that talk. If you're lucky, you might have 25 minutes. That would be for an invited talk. Uh, 
If you're a really, really special part of the meeting, there might be people who give what are called plenary talks, and they might give you even longer to talk. If you go to uh, a, uh, a university to give what they call a colloquium, you might get an hour to give that time, but that's about it. So, uh, and if you're giving an hour talk, usually it's to a very general audience where they don't understand most of the concepts that you're gonna be talking about. So you're gonna to have to start with the basic things and only get to the new stuff uh, toward the end of the talk. So you have to be able to speak in a way that is clear, that is uh, concise, where people will understand what, uh, what you're saying. And I still struggle with that. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, been frustrated with me not being very clear uh, uh, right now, but it's one of those things that, that, that I try to continually to uh, think about, how can I do this more clearly? So these are things that I think are really important. Another thing that may not be so obvious, and it may depend on your personal circumstances, the study of foreign language. Mm. When we were in high school, I studied French. And uh, uh, we had a really great and really tough French teacher, as you recall, Kathy. Mrs. Absolutely. Harris, Eleanor Harris, was tough as nails <laughs> in so many different ways. But we learned French. I went to college. I continued to study French in college. But here's the real important thing. I spent a whole year uh, working with French colleagues in Paris. And we spoke French in the lab all the time. These guys spoke perfect English. But I wanted to speak French. And they were very happy that I wanted to speak French. And they were very happy to help me in learning French and the personal relationships that we established were warmer and more strong because of the fact that we were communicating in French. And those relationships were incredibly important to me both personally and professionally. And those people are still people who I will call up and talk about physics on Zoom. Uh, in the old days, we would just call up on the telephone and talk about physics. And that was frustrating because we couldn't, you know, pass diagrams back and forth. Now we can, but it's still frustrating because it's harder to just go to the blackboard and, uh, and, and write things down. Uh, but, um, uh, but, but those, those relationships that I, that I, uh, that I forged there are, are, uh, are ones that are still important to me, both personally and professionally today. And I guess it's something that um, is true in a much more general way, that the most important things in our lives are the relationships that we have with other people. Well, thank you. I am going to ask one other question that you and I discussed. Um, it's one that uh, was asked by David Liu, who's an 11th grader at Dunbar High School. And I just wanted to acknowledge the question. Um, he wrote, "Is is um, I read that it isn't possible to use mirrors to direct light onto a small enough area so the area becomes hotter than the light source itself. Now, I'm not going to ask you to explain it, but I think what you said to me when, before we started this conversation about how you had to go. Exactly. Oh, is it, right. So great question. So and in order to, to, to try to understand the question better and to understand a little bit about how I might answer it, I needed to do some research. And I realized that there are two different things that come together to, um, uh, to inform this kind of a question. One of them is called the brightness theorem. And another one is uh, this thermodynamic principle uh, that in, is involved with this, um, uh, with this idea. But the thing that, that really fascinated me was that there were current papers things that are written just in the last couple of years in which people are questioning whether this is even true <laughs> uh -huh. or whether the things that underlie it are even true. Uh, and 
you know, depending upon details of what, what's the nature of that source? Is that source opaque? Uh, does it absorb everything that falls on it? What if that, that source is partly transparent? What if the thing that you're shining it on is partly transparent? What if you have gain? That is what, you know, uh, so uh, all of these things come into answering this question. So it's not a simple question, but let me try to give a sort of simple answer. Uh, let's add lenses to the thing. It may make it more obvious. You go outside in the bright sun and you've got a great big lens and you focus it down. You can burn paper with that, with, with the sunlight. And you might think, wow, I'm making it hotter than uh, everything else that's around. Yeah, but you're not making it hotter than the sun. And that's what the theorem actually says, that there's nothing you can do. There's no way you could use lenses and mirrors to make something hotter than the source, which is the sun, okay? The sun's really hot. It's like 6,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? So that, that's, it's not much different from 6,000 degrees Celsius, okay? I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. doesn't matter. <laughs> it's really hot, <laughs> okay? And uh, unless you do something funny, and that's what a lot of these papers were about, unless you do something funny, you can't, you can't make something hotter. So then I think the question has something to do with whether this was different when you had a laser. And it is, but mainly because of the fact that you cannot ascribe a temperature to a laser. So the sun is what we call a, uh, a thermal body. Sometimes mm -hmm. we call it a black body. It's not exactly black in the sense that black just simply means it absorbs everything that falls on it. It's not quite, but it's close enough. A laser is nothing like that at all. A laser puts out a single frequency, a single color, whereas the sun puts out a whole wide range of colors with a particular distribution that is characteristic of something that's a hot object. And so the question doesn't even apply to, to lasers. So that's part of the answer, okay? But then there's this other part that has to do with the brightness theorem. Well, anyway, it's a great question because it doesn't have a simple answer. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Well, that's a great place to end. I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I, you know, I, I always enjoy talking with you. I'm sure the students enjoy listening to you. And I really do appreciate your, your sharing your time with us this evening. Um, Okay, so thank you, Bill. Don't go away. Kathy, oh, I wanted pleasure. to mention one thing. Uh, <laughs> you said you were a tennis player. You said you did debate club. You were yeah. the valedictorian, et cetera, et cetera, of the class. But you were also a great photographer. Did you take that picture of the yellow, uh, above the yellow clouds behind you? Yes, I did, yes. I'm yes, not I surprised. did. I, I took this, uh, again, it was a scientific meeting in China. And as part of the scientific meeting, they decided to have an excursion. It's not that uncommon, you know, after you've had a long meeting or sometimes in the middle of a long meeting, yeah. you take an excursion. This was an excursion we had to take a plane to go to, but to the Yellow Mountains in, in, uh, in China. And there's this phenomenon called the Sea of Clouds where you hike up and it took us essentially all day to hike up uh, the mountain. And finally you get above the clouds. And you look down and that's what we were doing. And yes, I took that photograph. So it's an awesome picture. And I knew I knew you had done it. All right. I'm gonna sign off now. Thank you so much. And we'll see you afterwards.